بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما اختلف الذين أوتوا الكتاب إلا من بعد ما جاءتهم البينات بغيا بينهم فهدى الله الذين آمنوا لما اختلفوا فيه من الحق بإذنه والله يهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم صدق الله العظيم My dear respected brothers, my respected sisters who are also listening to this May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us come to the masjid May Allah make it an effort that we are sincerely trying to get close to the truth to Allah, to his messenger, to the deen and not to influence or allow things to influence our own thoughts and ideas To begin with, all of us have been born as Muslims okay, listen to this, most, most likely most of the people who are um, listen, you know, listen to this talk, you've been born you know, a Muslim. Perhaps there are a few individuals who are still trying to make their you know, um, uh, ideas about Islam and they listen to this. But most of us are, are being born Muslims. Being born a Muslim, you may have been born a Muslim, that's fine. But you've been born in a particular household. And being born in a particular household, your parents, my parents, they come from certain backgrounds, certain countries. And they have got certain influences and ideas, right, within the religion. We're not talking about ideas and things of cultural baggage and so on. We're talking about within the religion, they've got, they're already in different sects. Do you agree with me or not? You agree with me, right? Now, as I've been brought up, you've been brought up, we've come across a lot of stages of life. Number one is our parents, the most influential people that we've got in our lives. Number two is our, you know, our neighborhood, our close people to our parents, uncles, aunties, grandfathers, grandmothers and so on. They're very influential and they have a very big impact on our lives. In fact, they have the impact on our life when we can't even distinguish between right and wrong. It's a very important point I'm bringing up, right? Five years of our life, when you can't even think what's on, you know, where you are, these people are already teaching you what you're supposed to be doing, not doing, who you're supposed to befriend and not befriend and so on. Okay? Then we come to the madrasa life. In the madrasa life, depending on what masjid you've gone to, depending on what imam has taught you, they will also have a bearing on your understanding. All right? That's going to be the second massive impact. And they say there's three types of people. There's a type of person that you give him no evidence, he'll accept everything. There's another type of person, you tell him something, he won't accept it until you give him the evidence. And there's a third type of person, you tell him something, he doesn't accept it, you give him the evidence and he still doesn't accept it. All right? The first one who accepts your saying without evidence is the child. Without doubt, we can all agree to that. The child will accept whatever you say, in terms, especially in terms of religion. You teach him something, he'll just, just can say, okay, fine, I'll just do it. You know, you say this is the right way, he'll say that's it, that's the right way. There's no, and there shouldn't be no confusion with children, you know, in terms of this, that and so on. But anyway, second type of person is the youngster, the teenager, the one who's in mid-age. Yeah, all these different categories, you know, basically I'm talking to you guys. Right? Will you give him the evidence? Then they'll accept it. You don't give no evidence, they're going to say, mm -mm, can't take that. Right? The third type of person who doesn't even accept it after giving the evidence is our, yeah, no offense to anyone who's at that age, but our chachas. Right? Some of our uncles, right? some of our uncles, they get to a certain age, doesn't matter what evidence you give them, they say, you know, 14 centuries, my whole granddad, my great grandfathers, all of them have been hearing hadith. We never heard this kind of hadith, all right? so you take it back. So you've got these type of people. Now what we're really concerned about is the, is the middle one. Because the middle one is if given the correct evidence, they will accept whatever 
you know, we've, we've got to offer them. Now, as we move forward, what I don't want you to do by listening to this is to sit in one place and expect me to reach your conclusion. That's going to be the biggest disservice you can do to me and to any other person who's going to you know, cover this topic. If you're going to come to this lecture and you're listening because you want to know how right you are, then that's going to be a big trouble for me. Because I can't, I seriously can't satisfy everyone. I can't say, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, everyone's right. End of the day, you'll all be spitting back at me and saying that you're wrong. How can we all be right? Right, so first thing is, you've got to first move your own prejudice away. You've got to set aside, what you've got to set aside is, what you, what you got by the age of 10, by the age of 12, by the age of 14, whether it's at home, whether it's at the madrasa, Wherever you got, you've got to first put that aside and listen to me with a clear ear. You've got to give me a chance to try and say, and not just me, myself, and I speaking to you, it's whatever I say from the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay, you've got to basically have a clear mind and listen to this. You, can't, you cannot put another sheikh's quotation, another fatwa in front of you, another culture in front of you, another, you know, this parents and that thing and that all in front of me and say, but you're wrong. You, you can't do that. That's injustice. That's injustice to knowledge. Okay. We've got to go back to the original authority of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm telling you, by the time I've finished, by the time I've finished, there's going to be some of you, perhaps many of you are going to... Some, Basically, everyone's going to have something saying, scratching your head saying, hmm, but I never believed in that before. How come he's saying that to me? And how can he have the same skin color as me and talk like that? Yeah? Or how can he be from my background and talk like that? Or how can he do this and come to this masjid and say that? You know, al billah. I did say to Brother Sheikh Shafiq as well, you better cons consult Mulana Mufti Sadruddin Sahib, right? That I'm going to be talking about this. And if he's okay with it, I'll talk about it. Because the issue is not a light issue. You've got to go into groups. You've got to talk about their history. You've got to talk about where they come from or who's right, who's wrong and so on. It's not an easy issue to deal with. Right? And I'm just going to you know, deal with this straight up. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you. It might bring, you, know, you might ask me, what have I done? I'm probably already influenced by my parents, right? Yeah, see, you guys are quite clever, see? I'm influ influenced by my parents. I'm influenced by my Mulvisal. And he beat me up and taught me a few things I better not forget. <laughs> I tell you what I haven't forgotten from him, he's, he's beats. All right? But I tell you, there's been, there's been uh, you know, uh, an advanced uh, you know, stage in, in my life where I have always been open-minded to the best of my ability. With the Quran, with the Sunnah, I've done my best to keep my mind open. I've challenged my teachers. I've challenged them several times over and over again. There was a time in my you know, studies when I was a bit too young to challenge them and I got the bit dirty looks. <laughs> Merdab. You know, hasn't got any manners. What he speak about? Yeah. They've got, there, was a, there was a time when you go through that phase when they don't give you respect for what you're saying. But I'd already made my mind up that the truth cannot be what I'm seeing here. And then I went on towards my studies. And when you get a bit more mature, then they take you a bit more seriously. The same things you're saying, the same things you're saying to different teachers, but they, you get a bit more mature, they take you a bit more seriously. And then as I've been going along, I've been challenging my own views with several different you know, views that are out there. Because what you end up realizing is, I'll be honest with you, one of my teachers said a wonderful thing once. He said, whatever you do in life, he said, don't become the frog in the well. We said, Ustad, you know, what is the frog in the well? So he said, the frog in the well is a frog who's lived all his life comfortably in one well where he, the waters in that well have come up to, you know, his, just his arms and his comfortable, small, tiny, shiny legs, right? And he's sitting there just, you know, living off a few things that in this little well right at the bottom. One day, there's a bit of a tsunami. And what happens is that this tsunami hits a big tidal wave and it, and it throws a frog from the ocean into this well. And it lands right into the well. Okay, that little tide is gone, and now that frog lands inside. So the frog of the well says, because, hi, that guy, all right, yeah. Where are you from then, eh? So he says, 
Me? Me from ocean. I said, yeah, you're from the ocean. What is the ocean then? Tell me. Ocean? Ocean is water. Water. He says, water? He, he talk about water? Yeah? All right, okay, you tell me. Is it this much water? And the frog of the well, he basically, he just draws a small little, you know, part of the well. The guy says to him, no, 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 much more water than that. Lot of water than that. He says, yeah, really? Really? Uh, is it this much? And he draws half of the well. Yeah? And the frog of the well says, is it this much water? He says, no, 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 plenty more of water. Plenty more. He says, okay, okay. Listen, Giza, I'll tell you the one. And he basically draws a whole circle, the whole well. Of the whole well, yeah? And says, this much water? No, no, you mad, you mad. Not this much, plenty more water. What you talk about? So then the frog, the frog of the well says, Listen, you cracked, mate. You cracked. You got no idea what you took them about. If there's any water in the whole of the world, then this is it. That's what you got, Giza. There's no more than that. Right? So he just told him, you know, he's got loonies, and he's told me he's got loonies. Now we know who's right. Who's right? Who's right? Come on, guys, don't tell me you don't know the answer to that one. Come on. <laughs> who's right? The frog of the ocean. ocean you are. That's good, man. You know, you never, no one said well. All right. So frog of the ocean, he's right. Because what is it with the frog of the ocean that he's seen? He's seen that water. He's lived in that water. He's seen the amount. He knows what he's talking about. But will he be able to explain to the frog of the well? No. Why not? Because the frog of the well has only seen that much water in his entire life. There is no more water he's seen. No matter how much you give him, he will not take it. Now what I'm asking you to do, my, my, our teachers told us the same thing. Rahimahullah, may Allah bless him. He said, he said, whatever you do, he said, whatever you do, don't become the frog of the well. Meaning that if you've got this much knowledge, a little bit of knowledge, yeah, don't think you've got everything, right? Another man comes to you and he's got more knowledge than you and he can outpour it to you and he'll give it to you. Just, when you see the knowledge, just trust it. Don't just deny it because you haven't seen that in your life. Right? So I'm asking for us to get rid of our own prejudices and, and go ahead. So now getting down to the point. The first and foremost thing that we have to get to is the principles of the Quran. The most important. Then we have to come to the principles of the Sunnah. The principles of the Quran, from the principles of the Quran, is very clear. What Allah says in the Holy Quran. Okay? Allah says that He has created mankind to differ with one another. This is in the Holy Quran. This is in Surah Hud, the 11th Surah. Right near the end, one page before you reach the end, you will see that verse. Allah created men and women and human beings to differ. Basically, Allah is trying to tell us. He clearly said, If Allah willed, Allah would have made the entire population of human beings one big nation. We would have all been, you know, earthlings. Right? We would have all been worldlings, whatever name you want to give us. No country, no barrier, no different colors, no different tastes, no pizzas and laddus. Right? It's all just one nation that cooked the same thing, cleaned the same way, and everything else. Right? Allah said, if I wanted to, I could have done that. But Allah said, no, my idea was not that. My idea was, I'm going to make differences within people so that they may differ. Okay, that's one principle of the Quran. Second thing Allah says in the Quran is, There's various ayats Allah has said this. Various ayats in the Quran Allah has said this. So the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That, O oh Prophet, your message, or O oh listener, O oh reader of the Quran, your duty is only to convey a clear message. What does that mean? That means that not everyone will accept the message. It's very clear. Many places in the Quran look, وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَفْقَهُمْ most people will not deeply comprehend this. Most people will not believe in this. Most people will not know this or do not know this. So, I need some hot or normal water, inshallah. 
So this is quite clear in the Quran. Third thing, Allah has said in the Holy Quran, you will find this <coughs> at the end of Surah Alif Lam Mim As Sajda. Just pass, pass that. Out. It can be. Just bring some more water, guys. Okay, Allah said in the Holy Quran, <coughs> Surah Al Islam al Sajda. This is the um, 32nd Surah of the Holy Quran. Inna Rabbaka Yasilu Bainahum. And He has said this various places in the Holy Quran. Your Lord is the one that will decide between them on the Day of Judgment. Basically, many of the differences we have today will not be sorted out today we will have to wait <coughs> until <coughs> we'll have to wait until the day of judgment for these to be sorted out that is very clear in the holy quran you cannot disagree with this some people think that they can <coughs> eliminate every ikhtilaf in the world i am telling you from the history we've got this is not going to happen. Please don't make it your mission that your only mission is to make everyone agree to the same thing. It is not going to happen. It's clear cut from the Quran. There's another part in the Quran. This is in Surah at tawbah Again, right near the end. There's one page before <coughs> the end. You will find Allah says that <coughs> If one party of the believers goes in, <coughs> if one party of the believers goes in one direction, if one party of the believers goes to learn the religion of Allah, Allah says another party should go out and and do another action of defending the Ummah. Why? Allah said clear in the Holy Quran, so that both may benefit one another. Those who learn the deen, they will benefit the ones who went out and, and defended the deen. They didn't have time to learn the deen. They went out and struggled in Allah's pathway. They came back. They will learn from those who were sat in the city and they learned Quran and Sunnah. Those who went out benefited from going out they've seen a lot of things their iman is really high and strong they risk their lives when they come back they should benefit the people who are still in the city it's very clear in the quran allah has made this ummah specifically this ummah will have differences of opinions mark my words down 14 centuries we have not been able to settle many of these differences another 14 centuries might come and we still might not have settled the differences. Yes, when Isa alayhi salam comes, there's going to be a difference. When he comes back, there'll be a difference. But who knows how long we've got till that. And please, don't believe in all this literature and all this gossip going around. Mahdi is born. Isa alayhi salam is coming. You know, Qiyamah is here. Just don't believe in it, alright? Just don't believe in it. Because I've been hearing it for 20 years. I don't know how long it's going to take for Imam Mahdi to grow up, <laughs> according to these people. You know, he's, to me, he's not born yet. All right? In you know, if he is born, we'll find out. We, we don't have to hear the hadiths that you hear of him being born and then you wait for another 10 years till he comes out. The hadith says clearly that the, that the people that around the Kaaba will find him. When the time comes, we'll all know. All right? So don't worry about that. So coming back to the issue. <clears throat> These are straight principles I'm laying down. If you go to, if you look in 
the Quran, the Quran provides many different angles. The Quran is a source of many different rich aspects. Number one, the Quran gives us aqidah, gives us beliefs. Number two, the Quran gives us ibadah, how to worship. Right? Number three, the Quran tells us about social life. Number four, the Quran tells us about domestic uh, uh, social life and tells about transactional life or financial life. That's number four. Number five, the Quran talks about our akhlaq and our good character. Number six, the Quran talks about politics. If you disagree with me you, on these points, you will not remain a believer anymore. The fact that Quran discusses these six aspects. If you disagree with me on that, you will not remain a believer because this is the Quran. True or not? Okay, the Quran says all of this. So when you hear brothers saying that there's no politics in Islam, you better warn them and tell them, my friend, you are misled because the Quran talks clearly about, you know, you might not say the word politics, but it's got the whole concept of politics inside in various parts. All right? When I said akhlaq, good character, good morals, within that, there's a whole aspect of dhikr. Dhikr. And you cannot, as a believer, deny that fact that Allah is mentioning again and again and again and again that you remember him. In fact, Allah has said in Surah Al-Ahzab, 33rd Surah of the Holy Quran, in the 40th verse, uh, 41st or uh, around that verse, Allah said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amna dhkuru Allah dhikran kathira. O you who believe, remember Allah, bring him in your mind plenty and more abundantly. Now, here in this verse, those of you who study Arabic will know, Udhkuru Allah is a hukum, is a command of Allah. Then Allah has said dhikran, which is maf'ul mutlaq, which is for emphasis. Then Allah has used the word kathiran, which means plenty more, which is for extra emphasis. It's almost like Allah said, you remember me frequently and abundantly. Now, if somebody says that people who are constantly doing dhikr, dhikr, dhikr of Allah, they've lost it a bit. You're, you're misled. You're misled. From the very basic of this ayah, you're misled. Because this is a fundamental part of the Qur'an. Whatever is in the Qur'an, there is no ikhtilaf. Now there's two aspects to this. You'll find certain words of the Qur'an that are clear cut. Like this ayah said to you is clear cut. There's no, you can't say, well, dhikran kathiran might mean dhikran kathiran uh, at one moment. So that moment you do dhikran kathiran for that one little moment. The rest of your day, you don't have to do it. Um, Often that's what it means. You, you, you give me what you want, my friend. I'm going to throw it back on your head. It's, quite, it's clear cut. There's no ikhtilaf in it. There are certain other words in the Quran. There's difference of opinion. You can tell because the word is not clear. The word has got dubious meaning. You can have ikhtilaf. You can have a difference of opinion in that. We'll come to that in a bit. So I talked about siyasa, politics. I talked about akhlaq. And in that, I'm talking about dhikr. A lot of dhikr has been mentioned in our spiritual development. And again, with the word of spirituality, very clear in the Quran. Allah has said about tazkiyah. The word tazkiyah is in the Quran. That you spiritually cleanse yourself. In Surah Mu'minun, 23rd Surah, verse number 3. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ Verse number 4. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ Those who are constantly doing Tazkiyah. This ayah is not talking about giving zakah. It can't be. Because zakah was ordained in Medina and this ayah was revealed in Makkah by unanimously by all the scholars. You can't say that this ayah is talking about giving zakah. This ayah is talking about spiritual cleanliness. Look up the tafsirs, you'll find that. It's a clear cut of, of spiritually clean, cleaning oneself from the dirt of, you know, um, uh, jealousy, from malice, from hatred, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a part of our deen. Politics. Musa and Fir'aun have been mentioned. Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun have been mentioned. 137 places in the Quran. Each time Allah mentions them, there's a, there's a political situation. If you have to look deep into it, you have to see how they talk to one another. Just give you one example. 
Right? Musa alayhi salam comes to Fir'aun. And he says, Fir'aun, release Banu Israel. Fir'aun says, ha, 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 ha. Who are you? Huh? I fed you all my life. I fed you till you were 20 and you ran away from me. Because you killed someone, didn't you? <laughs> you murderer. That's politics. The man was a massive politician. I'm telling you, he would knock out this politician today if he was around. He'd knock him out two ways, with his words and with his, uh, with his uh, men as well. You know. But he was a big politician. But Musa, Allah gave him politics as well to play back. Musa said clearly, this is in Surah Al Furqan, no, Surah Shu'ara, sorry, 26th Surah. You will find it on the second, second page. It's about the 25th verse or something. You'll find it around there. Musa clearly said, he said, yeah, you fed me. Oh, and where did you get the money from? Oh, you fed me? Oh, you took it from the Banu Israel, my people. You made them slaves. You take money from them and you feed me? Right. And second thing is, I, and, and you know the crowd oh, um, um, what's, this, what's, what's this God you talk about then he cut the, he cut the kalam he cut the um, speech why do that because he was stuck what did Musa tell him you enslave a nation you make them slaves you, take, you make them sweat and then you take money from that and you feed me and you tell me that that is your favour what kind of favor are you talking about? Now he was stuck. It's like you know, today, same thing. You know, big countries go around and say, you know, we give big debts. This country it needs big debts. We give big debts. You little scumbag. <laughs> you scumbag, proper scumbag. You know why you're a scumbag? Because 300 years ago, you take the whole of the African nation, you make them slaves, 20 million die on just the route to America. 20 million, the biggest holocaust, well, one of the biggest holocausts, there's many holocausts, right? I'm not denying the holocaust, right? My friends, I'm not denying it, right? There's many holocausts, right? There's one that happened in 1945 or before that, that's fine. I'm not denying that. But there's a bigger one, which we should also remember. 20 million died just on the route from Africa to America. That's just died because they were sick. They just threw them off the ships. And then, when you enslave them, you make apartheid in, in that country, in America, until you can't take it anymore and the and the black man so-called the black man gets he get, becomes equal to you as a human being oh no got problem uh what do i do now then you you count your favors on the african nation that is that is to me scumbag politics right the same happens to many of these other nations all right you rip a nation from what you have then you can't feed them forget anyway i don't go too deep in this you look into this, you will find politics in there. That's two. Number three, you look at dealings. It's very clear in the Holy Quran. When they spend, they do this and so on. I don't have to go into that. Right? Ibadah is quite clear in the Holy Quran. Not, not, but the problem is here. This is the problem. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Aqimu salah. You establish your prayers. But Allah does not say in the Quran, lift your hands up here. Put them on your belly or on your chest or on your sides. Allah doesn't say that. Allah doesn't say how to do the ruku. Allah doesn't say how to do the sujood. No, He just says, do ruku, do sujood. Stand up for me. Do this. That's your prayer. That's all Allah says. Now, this is where the difference comes. We as Muslims have got no difference of opinion in the prayer itself. True or not? If a Muslim now says, if a Muslim says, that I don't believe that it is fard on me to pray. If a Muslim says that, that Muslim unanimously by all the scholars has lost his faith. But if a Muslim does not pray because he's lazy, the Muslim believes deep inside him that he must pray. The Muslim knows he must pray. But the Muslim says, you know, it's all right. <laughs> later on inshallah, bukla bukla inshallah. Yes. Okay. If a Muslim does that and he plays games with you to try and avoid his salah or try and give you excuses, but he knows deep inside him that he must pray. It's fun. He knows it's fun. That is a still a Muslim. Though he's a sinner, he's a Muslim. You have to accept that. That's unanimously agreed by 
by, by the scholars. There's a bit of ikhtilaf, a bit of difference with one of the um, statements from uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal on this. But generally, the Ummah agrees that this person is Muslim. <coughs> okay. When it comes to Aqeedah, now this is where we really start splitting the hair. Oh my God, man, the guy can't... You know, if you could split an atom, and an atom of an atom, you come to Aqeedah and that's what he's done. Alright? The Aqeedah of the Quran is very simple. Straightforward. And if you stick to that, just stick to the Aqeedah of the Quran, there is no scholar on this earth who can challenge me on this matter that if you as a simple believer look at the Quran and you read the Quran and whatever Allah discusses Aqeedah you just believe it as you see it there's no scholar in the whole world and I challenge you on this no scholar in the whole world who can turn around and say that you will not go to Jannah there is no scholar to challenge you on that the problem comes when you go beyond that. The, all the problems come when you go into the Sunnah, when you go into the sources that are not, you, you know, that are not clear cut in its meaning, clear cut in the words, or there's room for disagreement. That's where the problem comes. For example, the person reads the Quran, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah has power over everything. He just believes it. Allah has power over everything. He doesn't go into any detail how Allah has power. No, Allah has power. Finish. Qul hu wallahu ahad. Say Allah is one. The guy says, Amanna billah. I believe Allah is one. That's it. The guy, you don't ask him and he doesn't need to explain to you how Allah is one, how he's not two, how he's not half, all right? How he's, you know, tashbi, and you know, how you're going to get this sifa of Allah, this characteristic of Allah, or this attribute of Allah, and do you believe in this ta'wil, and this, thing? Uh, listen, the guy's simple guy, he says, what I see here, I believe, and there's certain parts of the Quran, that are complex, not straightforward, Allah said that in the whole Quran, look in Surah Ali Imran, beginning of Surah Ali Imran, about the fourth verse, you'll find Allah says, that I've given you two different types of ayats in the Quran, huwa alladhi anzala alayka al-kitab, minhu ayat muhkamatun, I've given you certain verses in this Holy Quran that are straightforward. And I've given you certain ayats in the Holy Quran that are dubious. So they have, diff they have a meaning that is not so clear cut. So Allah said after that, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَابْتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلِهِ وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah says there's certain verses here that have this nature of having two kind of meanings. And Allah says those who have an, a crookedness in their heart, they start to go into these matters and start looking into that. Now if you're a simple believer and you tell me, now, whatever I see in the Quran, I just believe it. You know, I just believe it. And whatever, whatever I can't understand, I'll leave it. You're a believer. Right? The problem comes when people start taking guns out. Have you seen the guns? Have you seen guns? I'll tell you how it works. It goes. Ain Allah. Akhi, tell me where's Allah? Quick, quick. Ten seconds quick. Before I, before I take Kevin, 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 Kevin. The gun of takfir. I mean, it's such a, such a cheap gun. And what he doesn't realize, what he doesn't realize, the guy who's holding this cheap takfiri gun is Rasulullah said such a thing backfires Rasulullah said clearly in Bukhari in a hadith Bukhari whosoever will label another person as a kafir and if that person who he has labeled is not a kafir then that statement and that fatwa will come back and fall onto him so you're going kafir and you don't realize it's shooting this way. <laughs> you gotta be careful. You can't just go and do takfir on people. It's clear the ulama have said if you find a person with 99 signs of kufr, 99 signs of disbelief, and one sign that he may be a believer then you've got to give, you've got to allow that space to still not judge him as a kafir. You've got to be careful. 
You gotta, and you gotta leave it to the most learned people to do it. You can't go ahead and start calling him kafir. It's such a massive matter because you could end up as a kafir. From Rasulullah Sallallahu fatwa. It's not my sheikh's fatwa. His sheikh's fatwa. It's Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi saying this. You better be careful in what you're doing here. And the matter is not simple. Yes, I do understand. If there's something fundamental someone denies, and I'm going to come to that in this talk, something fundamental one denies, then a person may lose the faith and lose the deen. Right? But if not, then he won't. Now let's talk about how this all works. Aqeedah, there's a simple part of Aqeedah. There's an Aqeedah that is clear cut, there's no doubt in. And then there's an Aqeedah that there's little bit of, you know, might be a little bit of interpretation difficulty in there. Then there's a another part of Aqeedah that there's a room for a lot of debate. You've got to be very clear which one you're talking about. And this is where a lot of the ikhtilaf and a lot of the differences come. For example, if somebody says, if somebody says to you, right, Muslims have no zakah, will you call him a mu'min or a kafir? He's a kafir. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr radiallahu in his time, exactly the same thing happened. Right? Now this is, a, this is where we understand the difference, right? You can't just go on to takfir, but if it's a fundamental part of the deen, it's very clear cut, everyone will say, no way. This part is part of Islam. If you don't have this, you don't have no Islam. What happened? When Rasulullah passed away, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr was faced with a dilemma with the Muslims. The dilemma was what? That there's Musaylama and his army, all of them, they're denying the giving of zakah. They say, we're not going to give zakah. We'll be here, but we're not going to give you zakah. The whole ummah at that time, including Umar ibn Khattab, including Uthman ibn Affad, including Ali, they all said unanimously that we cannot rage war against these people because they give the adhan. Because they pray like we pray. They read Quran like we read Quran. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr said, even if they don't give me the place of a whip, that much of zakah, even if they don't give me that much of zakat, I will still wage war against these people. And Allah gave him the faham, Allah gave him the deep understanding. And in the end, they all agreed with him and they went out to on a war against these people. Why? Because this was a fundamental part of the religion without which the religion will collapse. What are the fundamentals? The fundamentals are very clear. You believe in Allah. If any mu'min, anyone starts discrediting Allah, or adding something to Allah that he doesn't have, you will not have faith anymore. For example, somebody says, I have to quote this for the sake of quoting it. If somebody says that God doesn't have, you know, God can't do this. God can't do that. God can't do this. If somebody says that. They, can't, they won't have room for faith left. If somebody says that, you know, there are other gods besides Allah. If somebody says that, they won't have, if clear cut, these are fundamental of the deen. Amen to billahi. If somebody denies the angels, clear in the Quran, you will not be believe anymore. If somebody denies the kit, any kitab that Allah has revealed, somebody denies even the Torah, as originally the original Torah Allah gave to Musa salam, that that was not part of Allah's revelation, they will not be a believer. If somebody denies even an ayah or half an ayah of the Quran, they will not be a believer. At the same time, if somebody adds something to it, somebody says, they know what the Quran. Yes, this is Quran 30 Jews, but there's more Jews of the Quran that's missing. If they say that, clear cut to you, if they express that, that person cannot remain a believer. You can't add or subtract from these things. Billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rusuli. If somebody says that the messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, or one of the messengers in the past that have been clearly mentioned in the Quran, they are not, they weren't a messenger, they will not remain a believer. Somebody adds a messenger and says, Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani was a prophet from Pakistan and he was, uh, you know, Isa, whatever the gach much they say, right? Whatever they say, if somebody does that, there's no room for you in Islam because you've added part or to a fundamental part of the religion. Do you understand that? That's why we say Qadianis are not Muslim. Qadianis are not Muslim. And anyone else, whatever, for whatever sake, right? If another person comes and claims prophethood, there's going to be no room for them in Islam. It's the fundamental of the faith. If somebody, Billahi, uh, <coughs> 
If somebody says that on the day of judgment, they deny part of the fundamental part of the day of judgment. For example, they deny resurrection. They deny standing in front of Allah. And hisab, the accounting. That person will not have any space in Islam. Qadr, Allah's fate, whatever he's written, you cannot deny it, it's there. Right? You can't deny that, otherwise you will lose faith. However, in all these things, there's another outer circle. This is the most inner circle. This is the core. This is the fundamental. Whenever you deny that, you are not a Muslim. But there's things outside that, that there's, they, they are not so clear as this. For example, in the Sahaba's time, this is how Aqidah formed. After Rasul sallallahu alaihi had passed away, the Sahaba were left with the legacy of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and they had to deal with the new coming people. From some of these new people, from the Mu'tazila, from the Khawaris and so on, some people start to bring new interpretations to the deen. One of the things they brought was, they said that there is no punishment in the grave. There is no punishment in the grave. These people in the Mu'taz, in the very early, I'm talking about Mu'tazilites, in the very early people, they, they, logi, they made the whole deen logical. And they said, <coughs> there's no adab al qabr There's no punishment in the grave. They also denied. They denied the Prophet ﷺ going to Mi'raj. They said the Prophet did not go to the heavens and come back with his body. They denied that. They also denied... <coughs> They also denied seeing Allah on the Day of Judgment. They denied that. They also denied how the scales are going to be weighed on the Day of Judgment. Because they said that, they, they said regarding Allah, seeing Allah, they said you, Allah is not in one, one you know, direction, so how can you see Allah? They denied that. They said the scales, how can the scales weigh something that, you know, your amal, your actions don't have any weight? They are things you've done. So therefore they denied the scales on the Day of Judgment. And they denied quite a few things like this. What the Sahaba did here was a very, very important thing. <coughs> Instead of the Sahaba saying we're going to rage war against these people, like they did with the Zakah issue, the Sahaba took a different stance. And this is very important for us to understand. Because this wasn't something clear, clear cut. The Quran in 700 places it says, 700 places says wa atu zakah give zakah so many different places in the quran you will find it says atu zakah give zakah or at is zakah or give zakah and so on that is very clear even if he said it once it's very clear so they had to war, rage war but with these issues what did they do they took a different stance they said whosoever does not believe in the punishment of the grave Whosoever doesn't believe in that is not from us. But what they didn't do is say that that person is a kafir. Now see the difference here. They're trying to, what they're trying to now do is trying to say that if you want to be on the Sirat al Mustaqim, if you want to be on the straight path, if you want to be on the most core part of the deen, you better just believe in how we believe in and that's it. Because the Quran has said in Surah Baqarah, right near the end of the first Jews. If they believe as you have believed of Sahaba, then they will be guided. If they believe as you, your Iman is now a scale for everyone else to compare it with. Subhanallah. That's about the Sahaba. With regarding all these different aspects, they said, we believe in this, that's it. We as Muslims, we believe in this. And whoever doesn't believe in this, they're not from us. Not saying that they're kafirs or not, they're just not from us. There were statements like this made and later on the Muslims had to then codify this into make it, making it into Aqidah books. So they wrote clear cut. For example, Imam Ja'far al-Tahawi. Right? Imam Tahawi who has, who has written his famous book on Aqidah al-Tahawiyyah. Right? And the, the most ironic thing is, the most ironic thing is about this is everyone accepts this book as the core book of Aqidah. This is written about, say about almost 300 years, you know, after the 
Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's hijrah. Everyone accepts that this book is the most fun. He's only put about 105 different articles in there. It's very simple. He says, we believe in this, we believe in this, Muslims believe in this, Muslims don't believe in this, Muslims believe in this, Muslims don't believe in that, and so on, all the way to the end. That's it. It's very simple, straight up. The ironic thing is that everyone accepts him, but then after him, everyone says, okay, okay, let me now explain what he meant. <laughs> he meant this, Imam Jafar meant this, Imam Jafar meant this, and the next guy does the same, Imam Jafar meant this, Imam Jafar meant this, Imam Jafar meant this, and the next guy does the next guy does the next guy does and then they'll say, ah, hang on a minute. You, your book, different from my book. You, mm -hmm. not true believer. You, you different. You different. You different. I am on the only one, Jannati. I go heaven. Even each one is saying the same thing. Now, you know what I tell people? I tell people that keep it simple. Go to Imam Taha'u's work. It's not complex to understand. You don't need a, a heavy, you know, book that thick to understand a small booklet that you, you can just, just read literally in 15 minutes. You don't need a book that thick to understand it. And there's people studying this for two years. They do aqidah for two years. Another guy done aqidah for four years. And he met me once. And he said to me, Why have you done aqidah? Why have you studied aqidah? I said, That's the aqidah. It's so simple. We just studied the text. Is that all you spend aqidah? I spent four years. I said, Yeah, what a waste of time. <laughs> Spent four years. Oh, okay, brothers, no offense here. No offense, please. I know there's going to be people li listen to this. They're going to say, you know, I'm being offensive here, right? No offense. You c look, there's nothing wrong in spending four years. There's nothing wrong with that because there's people spend four years in tajweed. People spend four years in fiqh. People, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you think that that's the best thing you can achieve in life and that you're going to come back with not just one little gun, right? You're going to come back with 50 guns and a clashing clashing cover as well, right? To see how many kafirs you can make of this ummah, right? If you're gonna start doing that, then you seriously have got a problem. You know, there's a guy up north, North London, where you know he was in a mosque, right? I won't, I won't say his name, yeah. So, so what he used to do is uh, he used to come every day and he say, say, nah, aqidah is, aqidah is, this, and he's kafir, this kafir, that kafir, 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 kafir. That's all you hear, bidah kafir, this and so on. One day, the, the chairman of the mosque got up. And the chairman up there is, is a bit of a Guyanese guy, yeah? So he says, he says, Hey, Sheikh, what do you say? Sheikh, what do you say? You call everyone kafir? Why do you not do something for me, Sheikh? You go with only little people on a little island, yeah? And you stay on that, let the rest of us become Muslim. You preach what you want on that little island, let all of us become Muslim. Because it's got to be a point there. You start splitting hairs and everyone becomes kafir in the whole of the world because you studied the, the you basically, you start with Aqid Tahawiyah, then you go to one interpretation of Aqid Tahawiyah, then you go from one interpretation to an interpretation, an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation, and till you actually end up on your own with a few people. Now that is, you can't, because every guy that does that, you're going to be killing each other, and that's what happens. I'm not, again, there's, there's some sincere people who don't do that, okay? So let's exempt them. But there are people out there who actually do this, they get fanatic in Aqidah. And all they want to do is trying to say how you are wrong and he's on the chosen path to Jannah, right? And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a disease, right? Well, and the same thing happens with a lot of other groups, right? This is, I'm just dealing with, you know, with, with one particular group here, but... The, the same happens with a lot of other groups that, that you become fanatic in your own group and you don't see any other truth of anything else right so this is not the you know not the way forward this is not the clearly not the way forward so the sahaba what they did is they did that and imam jafar and many others they basically concluded on you know a risala or on a booklet about aqidah you stick to that simple those simple words you can't go wrong you cannot go wrong it says clearly allah has no dimension allah has no shape Allah has no, you know, you can't fit Allah into time or into place. That's simply understood. You don't have to go into splitting and splitting and splitting until you start, you know, disagreeing with one another. It's very simple. And the other ironic thing is, Imam Jafar says, you know, that this is the aqidah. In the beginning, you'll see this is the aqidah of 
you, you know, Abu Hanifa and Abu Yusuf and all that, you know, the, the, the Hanafi, you know, the great people of that legacy. They write that. And then I find it so ironic and so strange that people could come afterwards and label Imam Abu Hanifa as a Maturidi. And, uh, sorry, I'd, I'd label him as, as a Murjia. And say that he's from this deviant sect and that deviant sect. When Imam Tahawi has made it quite clear that his, his um, ancestors have, have written this. But anyway, that's just on the point of Aqidah. And what I'm saying is, I'm not saying today for you not to read anything and not to study anything else. No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying to you is, when you go to a particular Shaykh and you study under the Shaykh, especially if it's in Aqidah, please, please do me a favor and go and study the same thing with another Shaykh. Because the problem that I found with these certain brothers is that they study only with one sheikh. That's where the problem comes. If people study with several shiuch, then you can't, you can't keep your ideas onto one thing. If one sheikh teaches you for four or five years and he tells you, you've got to believe this and nothing else, that's it. If you go out of what I'm saying to you, you're going to be in the bottom of hellfire, stuck to the bottom of it. Like, you know, a burnt you know, pizza or something, right? The guy basically scares him to death to even go and ask the next, next sheikh down the road or the next imam or the next akhi down the road. He just scared him. And that's what happened. These are the most biggest fitna that we have in this ummah. Anyway, that's done with, with that particular you know, chapter. The other thing is, you have, you have had the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa preaching and you know the Quran had politics, the Quran had a social life, the Quran had you know, a knowledgeable life and all of that. The Sahaba drunk from this spring, holy spring of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they all, according to their character, took one line of path on themselves. Let me explain this. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the fact that he was at the same time the most spiritual individual ever in the history of mankind, at the same time he was the best general of an army in the history of mankind. At the same time, he was the best teacher, most humble, with the greatest of knowledge. At the same time, he was the best of husbands that he kept all of his 11 wives happy without any of them having any complaint whatsoever the Prophet ﷺ. at the same time he was the best of friends that he had all the sahabas believing that he was the closest to each and every one of them at the same time Rasulullah ﷺ was leading the prayers he was going out and meeting at the same time he was doing the public relationships with the, with the Jews of Medina, with the Christians of Najran, with the different people the hypocrites that were there he was, he was carefully diplomatically playing you know playing the game of trying to you know propagate the deen you will not find this miracle in any other individual again that's clear cut because it's a miracle how can one man do all of this how can one man do all of this but anyway what happened to the next next generation the sahaba the sahaba clearly couldn't take all of this on in every aspect so some of them became unique in one thing and some of them became unique in another they all had something basic. They all prayed, they all fasted, they all read the Quran, they all, you know, knew a few hadith and so on. They all uh, had, had, the, had the character, a good character and so on and so forth. But if, you, if I say Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, what do you not know him as? A person who quotes what? Hadith. See, you all know that. He became unique in, in the reference of hadith. You had... For example, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu. What was he known for? A warrior. Somebody said ninja. Come on guys, come on guys. Yeah, easy, he didn't go to China. Come on. Yeah. He was a warrior. And he was unique for that. You had, for example, um, Ali radiallahu anhu, who had a number of things. Amongst many other sahabas, they had a number of things. But one of the things Ali radiallahu was known for was a qadi. He was a judge. Right? Same, same. Uh, what, what did you know? For example, um, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu as a faqih, as a jurist. He was clearly known as a jurist, right? Each and every, like Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, what was he known as? Mufassir. He was an interpreter of the Quran. You went to him for tafsir. That's it. You didn't have to go, you know, very far off to find the bed. He knew the Quran better than many of most of the Sahaba, right? So each one of these took the different roles. Now when they took that on, when they took that on, 
The necessity of the deen was there in every one of these fields. People needed to learn the Quran. Abdullah bin Umar and Aisha radiallahu anha and so and so was doing that. People need to know the tafsir of the Quran. Abdullah bin Abbas was doing that amongst other sahabas. People need to know the deep interpretation of the Rasulullah's words and the Sharia. Abdullah bin Masood was doing that. Abdullah bin Umar was doing that. Aisha radiallahu anha was doing that. And so and so many others were doing that. Right? People need to defend the deen from the onslaught of outside. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu. You know, Amr bin Al As radiallahu anhu. Many other sahabas were doing that duty. Right? People need to, to know, for example, you know, quotes the hadith. You know, who heard this and Abu Hurairah radiallahu was doing that and so on and so forth. Now, do, tell me, has any one of you come across a hadith? Tell me one hadith where one of these sahabas says, says to the other sahabi, says, you deviant. Can anyone quote me anything right now? You will not find that. On this point of not calling one another you know, deviant, why didn't they call each other deviant? How did they respect one another and so on? I'll move on from here, inshallah. We will have to continue after Maghrib. Hopefully, inshallah, uh, you will say, Jazakallah. We went, went on to the point that the Sahaba did not point any fingers at one another and say, Oh Khalid, you're wasting your time outside there. You should be coming and helping me with hadith. Oh Abdullah bin Masood, fiqh, fiqh, fiqh. You've got no other work? Help me in tafsir. Help me in this work. You don't find that. Why? They understood from Rasulullah time that all of this is the works of the deen and the deen the beauty of the deen is the deen is a tree Allah said that in the Holy Quran the example of a believer is a tree you will find that in Surah Ibrahim Allah says the tree has one you know one trunk but once it has one trunk, does every tree just have one trunk and that's it? What does the tree have after that? Branches, several branches. The trunk was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And the branches are the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ma'in. And the branches coming off the branches are the Tabi'een. And the branches coming off the branches are the Tabu Tabi'een and so on and so forth. They understood that if Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is doing the work of Hadith, then he has helped me Khalid bin Walid because I don't have the time to go and spread hadith like him. Sayyida, Sayyiduna uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh, understood that if Aisha or let's say if Ali radiallahu anh, is sitting and, and judging people then he has helped me because I don't have the time to sit on that, that place and judge people as he is doing. They understood that if so and so Abdullah bin Abbas or whoever it is that they're doing a task then each one is supporting another. These are not matters to say, if you do not come on my pathway, then you have gone on to a deviant pathway. It's not that. And subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, and you, will, you have, must have come across the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that this ummah, that, that, that the uh, Banu Israel or the Jews, they split into how many sects? 71. And the Christians, 72. And this ummah will split into? 73 different sects 73 different ones and Rasulullah said Kulluhum fin nar, all of them will be in the fire except for one and they said Messenger of Allah which one is that he said Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi, the one I am on and the one my companions are on now everyone knows the hadith it's in Tirmidhi right the hadith is you know it's, it's a good sound sort of hadith but the problem is in understanding what is meant by the 72 and what is meant by the one these 72 and this one is, you know, they are not just one group. My brothers and my sisters, please understand this carefully. And any sheikh and any imam tells you differently, I am telling you and I can challenge that person that he or she is wrong in their understanding. What we understand from this hadith is very clearly that if you were to now count today from the beginning of Rasulullah's time until today, trying to count the number of groups. <coughs> if you in fact started today just counting today's groups, you will run out of 73. You will have more than 73. You're going to run into the hundreds. In fact, Imam Shahrastani, who had a book of Aqeedah, Al-Milal Wal-Nihal, 
in there there's more than the mention of 300 groups just in that time this was about 300 years after the Prophet 300 groups now you're going to now say to me well how is it that the Prophet mentions that there's going to be 72 different groups and now we find there's thousands of groups well the answer to that one is simple when the Prophet said that there's going to be 72 groups he meant 72 major groups under each one of these 72 there are several subdivisional groups and they all come under this one group for example those people who deviated in terms of ibadah in terms of worship they will become one large group under there you're going to get this ism and that ism and this thingy and that item this item this one there'll be hundreds coming until the day of judgment those people who deviated with regards to the Prophet ﷺ being the last Prophet and they said that Prophet ﷺ after him there is another Prophet Rasulullah himself said there will be 30 great liars in my Ummah 30 all 30 of these will have a group each true or not all 30 will have a group each they all 30 come under one big umbrella which is the deviancy of believing in another prophet after the Prophet it's one big umbrella under there there's several different groups that will come like this every deviancy every kind of deviancy if you count them up it'll come to 72 now when you come to the one which is the correct path the one which Rasulullah said I am on that and my companions are on that when you come to that one path where you can't tell me that that's going to be just one group you're going to have to also believe that that is going to be a large umbrella and underneath that umbrella there's going to be hundreds of smaller umbrellas do you agree or disagree with me come on guys do you agree or disagree with me uh, you're already 50 50 i'll wait till the q a yeah you got a chance at q a time if you want to disagree with me on this because if today you don't allow half of these parties that do not fall <coughs> under a disagreement with a major part of major fundamental part of the religion if you start calling all of these kafirs you're going to end up messing up the whole deen and you're going to end up contradicting this hadith and i'll come to which groups so some of the groups that have been mentioned under this all right according to this if i just Look, you know, there, there's, there's so many that have been, you know, Sufi, Shafi, Maturidi, Hanafi, Wahhabi, Maliki, Athari. What's Athari? So you, who, who did this poster? Athari. I was, I was looking at this, I'm thinking, I haven't come across that one yet. But it doesn't matter. Uh, don't know the problem. Ahl Hadith, Hanbali, Dewbandi, Jamaati, Brelvi, Madkhali. What's that one? <laughs> Madkhali, Ikhwani, Tablighi, Salafi, and Ashari. I don't know the, the, the two, three I said I'm not quite familiar with, but the rest of them I'm familiar with. According to my belief, all of these will come under that one umbrella. Now you're going to say, uh, uh, he can't be next to me. He can't go away from me. He stink. He's acting the stink. His praise is different to me. He holds his hand there. I hold my hand there. We can't be on the right track. Shake is wrong. Now wait, I'm going to minute before you just jump out and just walk away from the masjid and then not listen to another word I'm saying. Sorry to the brother who has a need to go, yeah? <laughs> before you do that, I've got to explain myself clearly. I've got to explain myself clearly. Some of these jamaats that have been mentioned here have got a difference in jurisprudence. And some of these some of these ones that you see here have got a difference in reviving the ummah there's two different groups here there's some difference in jurisprudence some in difference in reviving the ummah and some in difference in aqidah there's the three major branches you can see in all of these right for example or, or, or the fourth one i may say is a is a um, discipline of knowledge for example shafi'i hanafi malik maliki ahl hadith uh, perhaps Wahhabi as well uh, uh, and Salafi as well all of these have got difference in jurisprudence okay the ones that have got difference in Aqidah you can see Ash'ari, Maturidi, 
um, perhaps uh, the uh, Ahl Hadith, maybe in that one as well, maybe Salafi as well in certain aspects, they've got a difference in Aqeedah. And the ones you see, for example, Ikhwani, Tablighi, Brelvi, Jamaati, and so on and so forth, they've got a different opinion in revive, how to revive the Ummah. And we're going to deal with these three in these three different separate matters. They all, I said, fall under the umbrella that is Ana Alayhi wa Ashabi, the one I am on and my companions are on. For example, dealing with the, with the one uh, about the difference in jurisprudence. The difference in jurisprudence, right, the Sahaba, and you can see clearly how this started. When the Sahaba were in the Prophet Sallallahu's time, when they were in his time, if there was a difference of a matter, they went straight to the Prophet Sallallahu and they solved it. However, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on certain occasions showed us as an Ummah that you may have a difference of opinion in my statement and there is nothing wrong with that. Subhanallah. You might think, yeah, he's going to pull out a weak hadith now. Go and show it to us. This hadith is in Bukhari. Not a weak hadith, it's sahih. Weak, not weak hadith, it's sahih hadith. This was the hadith of Banu Quraida. Rasulullah just finished the battle of Ahzab, the battle of the trenches. <coughs> and he's coming back to Medina. Before he gets to Medina, Jibreel comes down to him and says, Oh Prophet, you're not going to Medina yet. Don't take your armor off. You're going straight to Quraidah. The Jews in Quraidah have committed treachery. It's an act of treason what they've done. So you must go straight there and continue fighting over there. Prophet Sallallahu said to his companions, my Umar companions, La tusallu al-asr hatta tasilu bani Quraidah. O my companions, do not pray asr until you reach Banu Quraidah reach that place where Quraiza live, the, the clan and the tribe of Quraiza where they are, you will meet me over there and we will pray. Oh, basically he said, don't pray Asr until we reach. That's all he said. Don't pray Asr until you reach there. Rasulullah has been left early. Sahaba left a little later on. When they left and they came part of the way there, they hadn't reached Banu Quraiza yet and they fell into a dispute. The dispute was what? The dispute was that Asr time is going. So what should they do? They should pray. Others said, nah. Prophet said, do not pray Asr until you reach Banu Quraiza. If I reach Asr, if I reach Banu Quraiza at Maghrib time, I will pray at Maghrib time. If I reach at uh, Isha time, I'll reach at, uh, I'll, I'll pray at Isha time. Prophet said, don't pray until you get to the, to get, uh, you get to Banu Quraiza. Don't pray Asr. The other said, no, no, no. The Prophet thought we might reach Banu Quraiza in time of Asr. So he wanted us to pray over there with him. Now that we're late, and the Quran has said, Inna salata kanat ala kitab This is the gist of the line of thinking I'm giving you. That the Quran has said clearly that every, every prayer has its prescribed time. Therefore, we are going to pray right now. So half of them prayed and half of them didn't pray. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now we're going to watch right, what happens because one of them is going to get a telling off, right? They both, come, they both told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam their dispute and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say anything. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This gives the establishment of two things. Number one, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has clearly shown from his words the Ummah may understand two Categories of the Ummah may understand two different things from one statement and Rasulullah has allowed that because whatever the Prophet gives tacit approval of Whatever he stays silent over that becomes the Sunnah The Prophet cannot Remain silent over Batil something that is not right something that is Absolute falsehood the Prophet cannot remain silent. Otherwise his duty will not be complete Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained silent. He did not tell some of them to pray again. He did not tell the others, why didn't you pray early? Second thing this hadith gives is the two lines of thinking. One line of thinking is that they literally take, they take every hadith in its literal sense. This literally means this, that's it. The other category, the one is the, you know, the literalists, the other is the holistics. The holistics are those who look deeper into the meaning. They'll say, okay, this hadith says this, but what about that hadith? What about this other hadith? What about this other hadith? 
they all have different meanings. I better combine between them. I better see what, which one is the closest. But this is contradicting this and so on. That's a holistic approach. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's this hadith in Bukhari tells us amongst the Sahaba there were these two groups. Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And amongst the Tabi'in, do you think they just ended or they carried on? They carried on. And amongst the Tabi'in, you pick up the pages of history, you will see these two types. There's one group that said, just follow Quran and Sunnah. One group that said, let's look deeper into the matter. Slowly, slowly, you started to get these divisions growing over time. In the time of the Sahaba, it was still simple. Because the Sahaba, in the time of the Prophet, it was simple because they could go to the Prophet. ﷺ. But when the Sahaba were left, what happened is Abdullah bin Masood went to Iraq, Ali went to Yemen, Amr bin As went to Egypt, right? Then you had um, Abdullah bin Umar, he stayed in Medina, Abdullah bin Abbas, and he went to Mecca. When they went to these different provinces and these different places, when they made the journey to these different places, each one of them became the greatest reference in that city. The people of Iraq did not see Abdullah bin Umar. They, didn't, they only saw Abdullah bin Mas'ud. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud went over to Iraq and he said, I heard or I saw the Prophet Sallallahu do this. Abdullah bin Umar in Medina, he's doing the same thing. Ali radiallahu is doing the same thing in Yemen or later on in Iraq. And so is Amr ibn As doing that in Egypt. And each one is doing it differently in their different places. And do you know what you find from the ahadith? I tell you from Sahih ahadith. From Sahih ahadith. From Muslim. From Bukhari. I will pick you out ahadith and show you. Where the Sahabi, for example, Abdullah bin Umar he says, he says, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In one hadith he says, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He raised his hands. And then he tied them. Then when he basically went before the sujood, he raised his hands. He says that in one hadith. Same Abdullah bin Umar says that I saw the Prophet wasallam. He raised his hands once and then he, does, he did not raise his hands in salah after that. Now you might think as a person who has not studied hadith, how can this be? How can this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happens because there's a development period. The development period in the Rasulullah's time was that you had salah changing. Now who knows what was the last sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? Who knows what he made the last thing? And was it the last thing he wanted? Or was it a sahabi that was there for a moment? He went away and he didn't see the Prophet ﷺ after that. And is that sahabi blamed for that? No, he isn't. Because he will just report what he saw from the Prophet ﷺ. If it was wrong for him to leave the Prophet ﷺ before the Sharia is incomplete, then you have to say it was wrong of the Prophet ﷺ to let them go before the mission finished. Yes or no? It was, you, you would have to say it was wrong of him in his lifetime. He sent Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu to Yemen in his last life, last year of his life. The Sharia wasn't complete yet. There are still some ayats to come down. The several ahadith he's going to mention. But he allowed Mu'adh, he said, Oh Mu'adh, this is Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari. Oh Mu'adh, when you go to Yemen, say this to the people. Say this to the people, say this to the people, and so on and so forth. And he in fact he even said, Subhanallah. He said, Oh Mu'adh, innaka, la'allaka. Oh Mu'adh, maybe you will come back to Medina. And Rasulullah is on the ground walking with him, holding <coughs> the reins to his camel, and uh, Mu'adh is on the camel. Prophet says, maybe, O Mu'adh, you will return back to Medina and you will not find me in Medina, but you will find this masjid of mine and my grave. And Mu'adh started to cry. And Rasulullah is, is giving him sympathy. And this is exactly what happened. Mu'adh returned and Rasulullah is down in the ground. So Rasulullah was given wahi for my Allah that Mu'adh will not see the end life of the Prophet and yet he lets him go. Knowing that he is only completed part and known part of the mission. What does this all mean? This means that Rasulullah allowed all of this to happen. So what about these Sahabas that are saying, I saw this and I saw that and the development period. There's one Sahabi in Sahih Muslim you will find. A Sahabi who went out in the battlefield, he came back. He went on a journey somewhere, he came back. When he came back, he knew Salah the way he saw it when he was last in Medina. So he came inside the masjid and he said, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman.